kick off our, our Heart Fair Summit, it's a real privilege for me to introduce Dr. Mike Felker, who's Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Heart Failure Section at Duke, also oversees the Advanced Heart Failure Fellowship. He was born in Arkansas, completed his college training at SMU. He's no stranger to Texas. His medical degree at Duke went to the prestigious Johns Hopkins where he completed his residency, went back to Duke for his cardiology and has been there since. He's really an international uh, recognized figure in, in the field of heart failure. He's, been a, he's played key leadership roles in several international trials and principal investigator of several landmark NIH-based heart failure trials, extraordinarily well published with over 200 uh, manuscripts. He's the associate editor of Jack Heart Failure and, and for us, uh, Dr. Felker, for you to be here today to give us the keynote on an update uh, related to heart failure with Reduce the F, we sincerely appreciate. Dr. Felker. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. My mom was especially pleased uh, to hear how, how great I'm doing, although she doesn't necessarily recognize uh, everything you said, but... Um, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and as uh, Jerry said, this is a beautiful, a beautiful place. Um, these are my disclosures. So I have the somewhat daunting task of speaking on the topic of uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, state of the art, which uh, struck me as one of those titles about which you can either uh, speak for five minutes or, or five hours, but uh, 40 minutes was something uh, challenging. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, sort of something old and something new, sort of like uh, like weddings. Uh, go through a little bit about sort of where we've, how far we've come, and I think, uh, uh, as Jerry said, it's Heart Failure Awareness Week, and actually stopping back to recognize the incredible progress we've made, particularly in this form of heart failure, I think is an important thing to do. And then we'll talk a little bit about the new th things, or relatively new, that are in the, uh, that are now in the armamentarium, some new things in the pipeline, and then some emerging issues that we're that we're dealing with in this space. So this is a, a great uh, a figure from, from Mike Bristow, which really summarizes sort of what everybody would say is the natural history and pathophysiology of heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction. This idea that it starts with some uh, uh, initial initiating event, which can be something sudden like a myocardial infarction or something uh, longstanding like hypertension. Uh, but then there's a variety of compensatory mechanisms that are initially compensatory, but then become maladaptive, and you have this inexorable progression of uh, progressive dilation of the ventricle and the development of symptoms uh, leading to death. So this is sort of what we think of uh, as the natural history of HEFREF. And uh, over really about a 25-year period, uh, we've actually defined uh, a relatively I think straightforward uh, armamentarium for, for stage C heart failure. And everything I'm going to say today is going to be focused on patients with heart failure symptoms. So uh, the AHA ACC guidelines talk about stage A, uh, patients with risk factors, or stage B, patients with structural heart disease. But I'm going to be focused on, uh, I guess, what you might think of as clinical heart failure, patients who have a low ejection fraction and symptomatic heart failure. And I think everybody is now very familiar with uh, beta blockers, ACE or ARB and uh, mineral corticoid antagonists, um, and then um, iso uh, isosorbide hydralazine in selected patients as sort of the pharm pharmacologic armamentarium of heart failure. And you'll be happy to hear, I'm actually not going to go through all those, because I think the whys and the wherefores and the hows of those treatments are, are now relatively well understood. Um, I do think it's worthwhile stepping back uh, to 1980s. Uh, Jerry was just a small child back then, but uh, um, uh, when, when the treatments for heart failure were digoxin uh, and diuretics and realizing how far we've come. So over a period from 1991, when uh, um, the SOLVED trial, the first trial of ACE inhibitors was published, uh, over about a 20-year period through progressive development of ACE inhibition, beta blockade, uh, and MRAs, and then if you add uh, ICDs and CRT on, on here, we've seen a 70% reduction in mortality in patients with HEFREF over about a 20-year period. So there's no other highly morbid uh, uh, chronic disease uh, in the century that I would say we've made that much progress uh, in a relatively short period of time. So sometimes uh, we sort of take this for granted, but I think it's worthwhile to stop and recognize that we've actually had a, a great deal of success 
And now we've really, um, I think, shifted this from this idea that this is an inexorable, fatal, progressive disease to a patient diagnosed today, I think, can really think differently about what their disease course might be. So not everybody is going to have uh, progression. I think most patients can help, can hope for what I'll call stabilization, that is halting at least for a prolonged period, uh, the progression of symptoms. Many of our patients get what I'll call remission, which is something we think of in the oncology space, but I think is very applicable to heart failure where patients have improvement in their ejection fraction and improvement or complete resolution of symptoms, and that often lasts for a prolonged period of time, although not forever. And then I think whether patients can have true recovery in the sense that they've completely recovered from uh, having heart failure, I think, is an area of intense speculation and debate, which I won't get into today. But I think it's important to recognize that we've, um, we've actually altered the, na the natural history of many of our patients uh, with HEFREF. Now, I'm, as I said, I'm not going to talk about uh, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers uh, and ARBs. Uh, but I do want to say a few words about a sort of a surprising area where we're actually having some innovation and new data, and that's diuretics. So everybody knows that diuretics are sort of the fundamental uh, uh, treatment for patients who have volume overload or symptomatic congestion. Uh, and everybody says, I know how to give Lasix. It's not, uh, you know, there's not uh, no nothing new under the sun. I think there is some interesting things going on in the diuretic space, and this is a, a review uh, that David Elson and I published last year. Uh, one of the nice advantages of uh, publishing in the New England Journal is they draw these amazing figures for you that you can put on slides then for like the next 25 uh, years. Um, but uh, uh, diuretics have several complicating issues that we have to deal with in our heart failure patients. One, if you look at panel A on the right there, uh, let's see, let's have a pointer. So the, uh, the, the, the dose response curve is shifted down and to the right so that it takes a, a higher dose of diuretics to achieve a lesser response in our patients with heart failure. Um, and also this uh, breaking phenomenon. So you have this profound naturesis. When you give the diuretic, then you have this period where there's no diuretic on board, where actually there's sodium resorption, and then your naturesis decreases with each progressive dose. So, so diuretic resistance, and anybody who takes care of patients with significant heart failure knows patients who are progressively resistant to diuretics uh, uh, is, is, a, is a major problem and challenge taking care of these folks. Now, mostly what people use is ferrosamide. Uh, it's sort of the, it's about, uh, about 80 or 90 percent of diuretic use in the United States. And I'm, what I'm really speaking about oral use right now. Ferrosamide actually is pretty terrible as a drug in terms of its bioavailability, mainly that its bioavailability when given orally is so highly variable. And there are other uh, drugs like torsamide, which has a longer half-life, which is uh, something that I think because of the breaking phenomenon I just described is a highly desirable thing in a uh, diuretic, and uh, it has much more reliable bioavailability. And there's some interesting data, which I won't show um, because of time, uh, that tamosamide is actually, uh, the torsamide is actually antifibrotic. So this has actually uh, led to, will be launched later this year, the first, uh, what I'll call the first diuretic mega trial. If you look at diuretic trials out there, the most cited diuretic trial is the DOSE trial, uh, which enrolled 308 patients. So when your biggest trial enrolled 308 patients, you have a dearth of evidence uh, uh, in your field. So TRANSFORM, which actually spells something, uh, which is a good thing for an acronym, is actually going to be a pragmatic NIH-funded trial, basically looking at a question, is it better to give patients with heart failure torsamide or ferrosamide? Uh, because there's at least some data from small studies and meta-analysis suggesting that torsamide uh, is certainly uh, associated with a better clinical response and potentially uh, better outcomes. There's also some interesting things going on with the diuretics uh, in the parenteral diuretic space. So we're all used to giving uh, ferrosamide uh, intravenously. Ferrosamide's very basic, so if you tried to give it sub-Q, you'd get skin necrosis and uh, it wouldn't be tolerated. But uh, this uh, combination of a reformulation of ferrosamide and this uh, subcutaneous patch pump, uh, which uh, is about the size of an iPhone, a little bigger, um, uh, which permits the uh, use of uh, ferrosamide, basically IV strength ferrosamide outside the hospital setting. It delivers 80 milligrams over a five hour uh, period. And this pharmacologically, if you look, uh, basically uh, gives more or less equivalent uh, drug levels of ferrosamide and more or less equivalent diuresis to what you get with IV. So when you think about uh, if you had a tool where you could give IV ferrosamide outside the hospital or patients could give IV ferrosamide to themselves, because this technology is designed actually for patient use, 
It opens up a whole uh, spectrum of ideas about how you might keep people out of the hospital, manage people who have recurrent admissions, uh, and we're actually launching a trial this year uh, 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 creatively called Sub-Q HF uh, to um, investigate whether we can use this technology to cut length of stay and hospitalize patients and also keep patients out of the hospital. So I think, strangely, uh, I think we're now in an area of some innovation in diuretic therapy, uh, which will be interesting to see as the, as, uh, as the next couple of years roll, roll on. So, uh, you know, if I was giving this talk in 1785, uh, for, for one thing, the PowerPoint would be much less sophisticated uh, than this one, uh, but we'd be talking about digoxin. So heart failure, of course, has one of the oldest uh, 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 described medications for any uh, uh, disease state that's actually efficacious, and that's uh, 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 digoxin. And then as I talked about, we had this period of incredible innovation in the 80s and 90s, where over about a 20-year period, we basically identified three highly effective classes of drugs uh, that decreased mortality and at the same time developed uh, ICDs and CRT. So uh, then we had this dry period. So if I had to give a talk in 2008 uh, about new innovations in heart failure therapy, it would have pretty much been a short talk. Um, but now I think we, we suddenly are uh, have the, both the uh, privilege and the challenge of how to incorporate uh, new therapies into what I think we'd all become fairly comfortable with, sort of the basics about ACE, ARB, beta blockers, uh, uh, MRA. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these two new players. Uh, I guess I've probably got about another year or two where I keep calling them new. After that, we'll have to start uh, change what we, what we call them. But I'll start with a story that I think is pretty familiar to everybody now, and that's the story of uh, Secubitril Valsartan, which, as uh, people I think are aware, is a combination of Valsartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker that everybody's familiar with, blocks the effects of angiotensin II by blocking the AT1 receptor and blocking all these bad things, hypertension, increased sympathetic tone, aldosterone, and a neprilysin, which, uh, um, uh, or uh, a secubitril, which is a neprilysin inhibitor, or actually it's a prodrug for a neprilysin inhibitor, um, which essentially blocks the breakdown of a variety of vasoactive peptides, including the natriuretic peptides, and a lot of people have focused on the fact that neprilysin uh, inhibits the breakdown of BNP, uh, which it does, but it's not clear if that's actually the mechanism for its therapeutic effect or whether it's augmenting some of these other things. But either way, the net uh, of all this is to uh, augment the body's natural sort of anti-heart failure defenses, you might say, and neprilysin inhibition res results in a variety of uh, salutary effects. Um, and this was studied, as I think people are familiar now, in Paradigm, which I think will go down as one of the true landmark trials in cardiovascular disease, now published, uh, uh, I guess now, uh, three and a half years ago. And Paradigm had an interesting design uh, component, uh, which has caused a lot of uh, furor, and that is that it had a, a run-in period. And we can talk uh, offline if people want to talk about the pros and cons of run-in periods, but... Um, the reason they had a run-in period was a simple one, and that is that for the first time, they were actually trying to prove that a new medicine was better than an old medicine, in this case, the ACE inhibitor enalapril. So if you think of all the beta blocker trials, the aldosterone antagonist trials with spironolactone, the ARB trials, they all were essentially trying to say, is the addition of this new drug on top of all the other stuff we usually do better? So they were all placebo control trials. This is a head-to-head -head against an active comparator uh, that was known to be highly effective, and that is ACE inhibitors. So uh, to do this trial, they wanted to ensure that patients were actually on and could tolerate an adequate dose of uh, ACE inhibitor, and hence the run-in. Uh, so about 10,500 patients entered the run-in, about 8,500 got randomized, so about 2,000 patients, or around 20%, dropped out. Um, actually, more people dropped out uh, during the enalapril phase than the, uh, than the scupitril valsartan phase, and most people who dropped out, it wasn't for intolerance, it's just they realized they didn't actually want to be in a clinical trial, uh, which is actually one of the pros of having a, a, a run-in period. But um, So 8,400 patients randomized, the largest uh, heart failure trial ever done, enalapril or scupitril valsartan, um, and I think everybody's aware of the primary endpoint of uh, paradigm, and if you can't remember anything else about paradigm, you just remember everything is 20% better. So 20% risk reduction in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure related hospitalization uh, with a very low number needed to treat 21 uh, of a scupitral valsartan over enalapril. 
20% risk reduction in cardiovascular death, 20% risk reduction in uh, heart failure hospitalization. And uh, uh, if you look at the cardiovascular death, there's actually a more or less similar risk reduction in sudden death and heart failure death. Um, so, so really impacting both uh, common modes of, of death and heart failure patients. And then uh, a, a reduction in all-cause mortality, which I think is really surprising, because as everybody who takes care of heart failure patients knows, heart failure patients are old. If, you, if that's news to you, then this is going to be a lot to learn in the symposium today. So, uh, so heart failure is a disease of elderly folks, and elderly folks have a lot of other comorbid things. And, and so even if you make their heart failure better, you're not going to cure their COPD or their prostate cancer. Um, and so to actually have a heart failure treatment that, in, that changes all-cause mortality in 2018 is pretty, pretty unusual. So I think these were striking results and a very large treatment effect. And again, not a treatment effect over placebo, but a treatment effect on top of um, other best treatments uh, uh, with a very good dose of enalapril. Now, what about tolerability, which if you have a new medicine, you know, do you get something for, for nothing? And I think tolerability is a mixed story. Uh, if you look at uh, things like hyperkalemia, renal insufficiency, uh, cough, they're all actually better with scubitril valsartan than they are with enalapril. The one thing that's clearly worse with scubitril valsartan, which makes sense if you think about its mechanism, is it causes more hypotension. And I think that's been everybody's clinical experience as well, is that when you start this drug, even in patients who have tolerated a reasonable dose of ACE inhibitor, you have to be uh, uh, watchful for, uh, for the blood pressure. And we can talk about that uh, in a minute when we talk about implementation. Um, angioedema, which was a substantial concern uh, based on the failure of prior drugs that impacted nephrolysin, uh, basically was a very rare and not significantly uh, different. So safe, well-tolerated, and better uh, than ACE inhibitors. And just to put it in context again, uh, to, uh, I think it's important to realize that when we talk about a 20% risk reduction, which we're used to seeing in successful clinical trials, this is unusual because it's a 20% risk reduction on top of something that was already highly effective. Or to put it another way, uh, scubitril valsartan is as much better than enalapril as enalapril is better than nothing. So basically, or another way you can think about it, would be a doubling of effect of uh, enalapril when you think of uh, relative risk reduction. So, uh, so it's a very substantial, I think, clinically important um, benefit and uh, advance. And many people have looked at the paradigm data and said, we got to figure out who really benefited from scubitol valsartan over enalapril. So who should we really focus on switching? Because should we switch everybody? Should we switch nobody? What kind of patients should we switch? Well, if you look at the data and you want to be data-driven, so these are all these subgroups, you basically, no matter how you split it, and there's literally been hundreds of subgroups done now, you, you really can't find any group where if you said, if you were like this, it would have been better for you to actually just to be on enalapril. No matter whether you're old, young, sick, less sick, uh, man, woman, whatever it is, you're better off having been randomized to scubitol valsartan than to enalapril in the paradigm study. So I think... There are all sorts of uh, rationales and things people have talked about about why you might or might not switch certain groups of patients from an ACE inhibitor or an ARB to scubitril valsartan, but, um, but I, I don't think you can derive those from the paradigm data. They have to be derived from some other consideration. So uh, the results of paradigm created what I think is one of the most confusing guideline statements uh, that we have, and I, I'm sympathetic to Clyde, Yancey, and the guideline committee because they, they really were, uh, for the first time, they had uh, something that had been a class one a level of evidence A indication of the guidelines since the very first guidelines for heart failure in the 90s, ACE inhibitors. They didn't want to take that out, but now they had something else that head to head seemed better. So we have this kind of strange recommendation. So it's still a class one uh, level of evidence A that you should be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. It's a class one level of evidence B because it's only one trial, although you could argue paradigm was so big it's actually a higher level of evidence than, than several trials, to be on an ARNI, which is uh, an angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor, of which right now there's only one scubitril valsartan. Um, so it's a class one indication to be on an ACE or an ARB, but it's also a class one indication to change from an ACE or an ARB if you're on one to something else. So this creates a little bit of cognitive dissonance about what to do. Um, 
and uh, we'll talk about uh, how we might think about implementing these, this evidence. So uh, as I said, I think there's still a lot of confusion about who you should switch, uh, who you should, might not switch. Obviously cost is involved because the drug is obviously more expensive than a generic ACE inhibitor. Most patients tolerate it reasonably well, although patients with borderline blood pressure uh, uh, have a little more trouble. There's a variety of ongoing studies trying to fill in gaps. We don't know anything about HEFPEF. There's a large HEFPEF outcome trial uh, that's enrolled now and it's just in follow-up. There's a trial randomizing patients to be started in the hospital because we all know in the hospital is often a good time to fine-tune people's medicines, but we actually don't have any data on Secubitril Valsartan in the hospital. A post-MI heart failure trial, a Paradise. Uh, there's a, a NIH trial looking at uh, patients with relatively advanced heart failure. Um, because those are the patients, because you're worried about blood pressure, especially that you uh, worry may not be able to tolerate it. And then there's a large registry looking at uh, uh, trying to understand the mechanisms of benefit uh, and the uh, biologic effects of neprilysin uh, more effectively. So this is actually a figure from a great paper I would highly recommend everybody read. Uh, it just came out this year in Jack. It's called, it's like an expert panel about heart failure. Really what it is is trying to look at the guidelines in the context of actual hard clinical decisions you have to make every day. So it doesn't have all the like level of evidence, one, two, three things that you're used to. Um, it's really about implying the guidelines in heart failure. So it's called something like expert consensus panel in heart failure or something. And it has a lot of very practical sort of flow charts. And this is one, uh, basically, t how do you, if you decide you want to switch somebody from an ACE or an ARB to Secubitril Valsartan, how do you do it? And the, the big things to remember are, if they're on an ACE, you have to wait 36 hours for the ACE to wash out before you start Secubitril Valsartan, because you don't want to give ACE and Secubitril Valsartan on top of each other because of the angioedema risk. If they're on an ARB, there's no washout period. You can just stop one and start the other. Um, and you can basically pick a dose based on how much ACE or ARB they can tolerate. The big thing that's not on this, which is just clinical anecdote and not uh, uh, evidence-based, is they'll tolerate this uh, if they're euvolemic or a little bit volume overloaded, better than if they're dry. So the patients who tend to get hypotension when you switch are patients who are relatively uh, volume depleted. And so a lot of people, including me, if they're going to switch, cut people's diuretic dose. Because Scooter Valsartan actually has a diuretic, it's not a diuretic, but it has a more diuretic effect than an ACE inhibitor because of neprilysin inhibition. So I usually have people's diuretic dose uh, at the time that I initiate um, unless they're super volume overloaded, which is probably not the best time to be messing with their chronic treatment. So I'm going to uh, uh, cover, so that's Scupertrol Valsartan. I've got the other sort of uh, player, which has kind of a strange story, because this is a drug now that's been in, in, in use in Europe for almost a decade, is Evabradine. So Evabradine uh, is a drug that modulates heart rate, and we know heart rate is a, uh, a major uh, risk factor in, uh, in heart failure. And if you go around the hospital and you look at everybody's tele and you see somebody uh, you know, if you ask people, or if you ask me, what's the most worrisome rhythm on telly? It's sinus tack. Uh, so I'm much more worried if my heart failure patient has a sinus tack at 115 than I am if they have uh, non-sustained VT. I guess V-fib would probably be a little more worrisome, but uh, uh, unless they're a VAD patient, they're like reading the newspaper. But uh, um, uh, so uh, so we know heart rate is a risk factor. Uh, in, uh, in heart failure, and Evabradine is an interesting drug. It basically does one thing, and that is it impacts this uh, IF channel, so-called the funny channel, uh, which is only uh, in the sinus node, and basically it just turns down the speed of the sinus node. And so that affects heart rate if you're in sinus rhythm. Obviously, if you're in some other rhythm like atrial fibrillation, this doesn't have any effect on heart rate. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, the beta receptor, doesn't have any effects on the vasculature, it's actually a, a, a nice drug in the sense that it basically does one thing, it makes the heart rate slower. This was studied in the SHIF trial, which actually occurred now over a decade ago. Um, and so this drug was developed in Europe, no US patients, approved in Europe uh, in 2011, I guess, and has been used for uh, now almost a decade in Europe. And then there was a seven year gap before it got approved in the United States, which is there are complicated reasons we could talk about if people want, but um, essentially a traditional uh, HEF-REF trial, uh, uh, about 6,500 patients, low EF. You need to have a heart rate greater than 70 and be in sinus rhythm to get in the trial. So obviously if your patients are in chronic AFib, uh, this doesn't matter. 
There was a lot of emphasis on trying to maximize beta blocker treatment, although despite all those efforts, uh, only about uh, half the people were on about 50% of the dose. So this just shows that it's hard to get uh, uh, heart failure patients to their target dose. Um, Evabradine, as you might expect, decreased the heart rate, which is what it was supposed to do, compared to placebo. And again, about a 20% risk reduction in the composite of death or uh, heart failure hospitalization. If you look at the secondary endpoints, this is really mostly driven by hospitalization. So the way I would put Evabradine in your mental framework is that Evabradine is a drug in patients who have sinus rhythm, elevated heart rates, greater than 75 is what the label says, um, and especially if recurrent hospitalizations is an issue, those are good people to target for evabradine because its primary effect seems to be uh, in diminishing uh, hospitalizations. And as you might expect, the greater drop in heart rate you got with evabradine, uh, the more effective it was. This is what the guidelines say. It's 2A, so not as strong a level of evidence as uh, some of the other data that we've seen from ACEs, ARBs, uh, uh, sartan. Um, and what the, the label says is EF less than 35 and heart rate of uh, uh, 70 uh, or greater and sinus rhythm. So I think this is, I don't think a blockbuster uh, addition to our armamentarium, but I think a nice addition to our armamentarium in selected patients. And I, if you see that person who just has that sort of seems like kind of an inappropriate level of sinus tack, even though they're on a good dose of beta blocker, um, I think those people are good, good candidates for uh, of Aberdeen. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about some things in the pipeline because I think uh, there's always room to continue to think about new mechanisms and these are a couple of interesting drugs. So inotropes are like the impossible dream and heart failure because if the heart doesn't squeeze uh, um, uh, strongly enough then a drug that makes the heart squeeze more strongly just makes sense that it ought to be a good thing and if you talk to patients and you say your heart is weak it doesn't squeeze very well often they ask what can you give me that would make my heart squeeze stronger? Because that seems like a good thing. But inotropes uh, traditionally are a little bit like this taste test that basically get the same result no matter what, uh, what kind you, you use, that they just, um, uh, all traditional inotropes have increased mortality, and there's a lot of data to support that, and this is just one, and this is IV inotropes in the hospital, and this is cohort match for disease severity. Patients uh, who get uh, inotropes do worse than patients who get other forms of, of treatment. Um, but I think the, the interest in continuing to try to develop inotropic drugs or drugs that increase cardiac output um, is still there. And this is a super interesting molecule from a scientific standpoint, I think. It's called omocamptive macarbal, which does not exactly roll off the tongue, but um, is, uh, that's what it's called. So uh, it's a small molecule, and it, uh, it increases the interaction or alters the interaction between actin and myosin. So if you remember from medical school, this whole cycle of actin and myosin binding and unbinding, basically omocamptive macarbal, uh, to use an analogy, you can think about it as putting more hands on the rope. So uh, usually your actin and myosin cross bridges, a fair number of them are actually uh, going back and forth without actually binding on to the rope and generating any actual work. So um, because it basically puts more hands on the rope, at least in experimental models, it increases stroke volume but does not increase myocardial oxygen consumption, does not increase heart rate, uh, does not increase intracellular calcium, all the other things, uh, and, and is not prerhythmic, all the other things that uh, traditional inotropes are concerned about. And this is animal data, but basically just shows that if you give a traditional inotrope like dibutamine, it increases DBDT, that is the speed of contraction speeds up, the heart squeezes harder. Really, with this drug, the heart doesn't squeeze harder, DPDT doesn't change, uh, the heart squeezes longer. So what it really does is prolong the duration of systole. So if you used to squeeze down like this and then interdiastole, now you squeeze down for a little bit longer and so stroke volume um, increases. So that's an interesting drug. Um, it's both IV and oral. We initially uh, studied in this paper of now a couple years ago in the Atomic study uh, published in, uh, in, in Jack. And this is in the hospital in acute heart failure patients. And this just shows the, the relationship between the concentration of the drug and systolic ejection time, how long systole is. And as you can see, in general, it prolongs systole like it's supposed to. Um, in this trial, we were looked uh, at short-term endpoints like breathlessness, which depending on how you slice it, you could see a little bit of potential benefit at the higher doses, although not clear how much benefit this was. But we found a potentially concerning safety signal, and these are different uh, ascending doses uh, of the drug, whereas the higher dose of the drug you were on, the higher your troponin was. And these were relatively small changes in troponin 
if you look here, but, um, but, but real, I think. They went up, depending on dose, and when you stop the drug, they went back down. Um, so it's the drug actually it binds right there where troponin is, so whether this is actually a drug effect or just related to mechanism of act, action or actual injury, I think, is unknown. Uh, we went on to study the oral drug in, um, uh, in chronic heart failure patients, and this paper was published uh, last year in The Lancet. Um, uh, called Cosmic, so Atomic, Cosmic, you're getting a theme here, um, um, and uh, increases systolic ejection time. Sorry, this doesn't probably show very well. Um, but several interesting things in this longer-term study, so 20 weeks of treatment. So favorable ventricular remodeling, the ventricles got smaller, so this is uh, in, in uh, a systolic and in diastolic, uh, uh, sorry, that's heart rate, uh, in diastolic volumes up there, uh, and, and ejection fraction, and then NT pro BNP. So, Heart rate went down, NT pro BNP went down, and the ventricles got smaller when the drug was given for 20 weeks. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting finding. And again, we saw this, uh, if you just look over here at the pool uh, uh, column of, these are all the patients who got on mecantomacarbal, uh, a small increase in troponin when the patients were on the drugs, 0 0.004, so really small, and then back to normal after the washout period. So there is this troponin signal. I think it's not clear what that means. Um, but in general, drugs that uh, make the heart smaller, make heart rate go down, and make NT pro BNP go down when given chronically are drugs that are effective long term. So beta blockers do that, ACE inhibitors do that, ARBs do that, MRAs do that, Sprotolactone valsartan does that. Um, on the other hand, drugs that make your troponin go up are almost always bad. So this is really uh, a question of perception and uh, this slide is a great uh, gauge of how geeky the audience is. Like the geekier the audience, the bigger the laugh. And so nobody, not a single person here laughed a bit. <laughs> so congratulations, or I'm sorry. When I showed this at Yale, they laughed hysterically. <laughs> um, so um, uh, so I, I think uh, you know, these are all things that seem favorable, but uh, again, can a drug that causes your troponin to go up actually be good for you? So that's equipoise, of course. And we're now uh, have just uh, about halfway through, I guess, <clears throat> randomization in galactic. So we had atomic, we had cosmic, we had galactic. Uh, 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 randomizing uh, HFRF patients to long-term treatment with this drug uh, as a mortality uh, and morbidity trial. So it'll be interesting to see. This is actually the biggest trial of an inotrope that's ever been uh, studied. Technically, this drug is not actually an inotrope. And the, an inotrope is a drug that increases DPDT, so it's not an inotrope, I guess, it's inotrope-like, or it's a drug that increases stroke volume, I guess you could say. So this will be interesting uh, to see how this plays out. There's another uh, trial going on simultaneously uh, with another interesting agent, and this is a class of agents that people are familiar with from the pH space, guanylate cyclase uh, 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 drugs, and uh, there's many ways you can uh, modify cyclic GMP signaling and we traditionally do it, with, which we know is a good thing in cardiovascular disease in general and heart failure in particular. Traditionally, we can do it with uh, NO donors or we can block the degradation with uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Uh, Verisiguat both uh, stimulates the solute, soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme directly and also makes it more sensitive to the effects of nitric oxide. Uh, so two mechanisms by which it increases cyclic GMP. This has been studied in a variety of uh, phase two trials and this is uh, the data from Socrates reduced so the trial in patients with low EF, and again, similar sort of secondary endpoints that you're looking at in these phase two trials to try to figure out if you've got an effective drug, you want to move on to larger studies. Uh, so improvements in antiprobian P, uh, improvements in uh, ejection fraction or remodeling at least, and at least a suggestion of improvements in outcomes. All these small trials are underpowered for outcomes, but you can see uh, that the... Um, the various forms of, uh, of erisiguat uh, did better than uh, placebo, which is the green line here, although it doesn't show up uh, super well. So again, I think suggestions that you might have an effective drug, which is what you uh, uh, want to have when you're do uh, leading to a bigger trial. And so this is Victoria, which again is ongoing, not quite as big as Galactic, but uh, studying this drug given chronically a long-term morbidity and mortality trial. So we now actually have two interesting new drugs, both in the middle of long-term morbidity and mortality trials, which are more or less on pace to give us results uh, about the same time. So I think there's still some interesting things out there in the pipeline. 
So I'm going to close and just talk a little bit about two areas that aren't related to specific drugs uh, particularly, but just some areas uh, of interest. So this is actually, I think, a really important study, and, um, and I'll, I'll just summarize it to show that uh, this is uh, Doug Lee's data from Toronto, uh, that uh, patients who are the sickest, who are going to have the worst outcome in heart failure, and that's the, the different color line. So this is one-year mortality rate. So whoop, whoop, I blew the punchline. Ah. Um, so patients who are sickest uh, in the green lines, uh, wellest in the blue lines, the sicker you are, the less likely you are to be treated with effective uh, therapy. So the sickest patients are treated the least, least intensively, which obviously is sort of risk treatment mismatch. So we don't do a good job of, uh, um, uh, um, takes a while for the lab, but it comes. Keep, 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 keep reading, I have to think about it a second. Uh, so we don't do a good job of optimizing guideline medical therapy in our, in our heart failure patients. So of course, how can we do better? Well, we, um, we often uh, do better um, um, uh, um, if we have a target or something to guide us to help us know which way we're, we're trying to go. Uh, so what might we use as a target in, in heart failure? Well, of course, we all know that the nature of peptides measuring BNP or anti-pro-BNP are highly associated with mortality. And that has led to this idea of, gui of biomarker-guided therapy, the idea that you should titrate your chronic heart failure medications, your beta blockers, your ACE inhibitors, your diuretics, et cetera, to try to achieve a given target, the lowest NT pro BNP or BNP, you can pick a target, um, and that that might be an effective way to treat heart failure. And that's actually how we treat most chronic diseases. So we don't go to the diabetes clinic and say, we're gonna give you as much insulin as you can tolerate. We tight, we have a hemoglobin A1C that we know is associated with good outcomes, and we have a variety of tools we know that manipulate blood glucose, and we try to get the hemoglobin A1C to a target and keep it there. And we do the same thing with uh, lipid management with a variety of chronic diseases. Actually, heart failure is one of the few chronic diseases that we don't treat in this way. And there's been a bunch of small studies and meta-analyses suggesting that this might be effective. Uh, way to treat heart uh, for your patients, what I'll call biomarker-guided heart failure therapy. Um, I'm always, I think you should generally be leery of meta-analysis that combine tons of very small studies because they often, uh, there's a strong publication bias uh, uh, in those scenarios. So the way you address that is to do a bigger trial, which we did, this is GUIDED, which was an NIH funded trial we just published uh, last fall. Um, and basically, uh, the goal of GUIDED was to randomize uh, 1,100 patients to who were high risk uh, patients who had just been in the hospital uh, uh, with low EF and a high NT pro BNP, either usual care or this uh, NT pro BNP guided uh, treatment arm with a, uh, with a goal of less than 1,000. Uh, unfortunately, like a lot of good ideas, it didn't turn out to work. So this is usual care versus biomarker guided. And you can see they had identical uh, 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 long term outcomes. And if you look at the percent of patients who were on the best medical therapy, they were actually very similar uh, in the usual care arm uh, and the biomarker guided arm. So we didn't actually um, uh, show that we could get people on better treatment. One of the flaws in guided was they were mostly at places that were really experienced and interested in expert heart failure sites. And so they were already doing a very good job with guideline medical therapy. So whether we could have shown a bigger difference with less experienced sites, I think is an open question. Not surprisingly, when you look at the NT-pro BNP values, which were blinded in the trial, but uh, uh, from the core lab, you see that they're almost identical. So I think uh, whether or not this is still an idea that has some legs, I think is uncertain. Um, but I think it does point to the idea that uh, a major unmet need in heart failure is how to implement the drugs we already have and the tools we already have in an effective way. And that's at least as important as developing new treatments. And then I'm going to close, because uh, I'm in Texas here, with uh, uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, a brief word about uh, diabetes. I, uh, so when, uh, when, uh, when Jim Hill shows, uh, Joe Hill shows this, he has a cowboy hat on the guy at the right, but I thought that might be offensive to this audience. So I, I, uh, we have plenty of this in North Carolina as well. So everybody knows there's this major obesity epidemic in, uh, in the Western world. And uh, in parallel to that, we've had this incredible decade of these cardiovascular outcome trials in diabetes. So the FDA made this rule that if you want to have a new diabetic drug that gets approved, you 
have, you can get it approved by showing that it, it controls glucose, but then you have to do a big trial to show that it's safe. That is, that it does not increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, which doesn't seem like a very high bar because one of the reasons we want to control diabetes is to decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. But anyway, you had to, and so for the three uh, classes of anti-diabetic drugs that have uh, been developed, the DPP-4 inhibitors, the SGL2 uh, inhibitors, and the GLP-1 agonists, they've all undergone all these huge trials, and it's very confusing. It's a whole alphabet soup of, of acronyms. But several interesting things have come out of the trials. Um, and one of the first and surprising things, and this is with saxagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, uh, was this signal of increased risk uh, of heart failure in patients. And this is uh, uh, the SAVER trial, uh, increased risk of heart failure, about a 30% risk, increased risk of heart failure uh, in a trial that was overall neutral for cardiovascular outcomes um, with this agent. And one of the things that there's a lot of question about whether this was real or not, um, one of the things that happens is the longer you're on a trial, the more, the more likely you are to sort of drop off of taking the drug. But the risk was the highest relatively early when a lot more people were taking the drug. So that is something that suggests it could be real. Um, there are two other major trials with similar drugs. So there's uh, Saver, Timmy 53 with saxagliptin, exam with allagliptin. Um, so again, these were neutral on their primary endpoint, which was not about heart failure, was just about all cardiovascular events. Uh, allagliptin. 7% uh, increased risk of heart failure events. Uh, Citagliptin, TCOS, uh, which was a Duke trial, uh, 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 no increased risk. So still uncertain if there was actually an adverse effect of these class of drugs or not. And if um, right now the FDA has a black box warning for use in heart failure with saxagliptin and, and allagliptin, although you could argue that the signal with allagliptin is pretty weak. Um, and so everybody said, oh, this is going to be really interesting because these new diabetic drugs uh, might be bad for you if you have heart failure. And so then Ampareg with uh, empagliflozin came out, and what they found was empagliflozin, which is a SGL2 inhibitor, uh, was actually good for you if you had heart failure, or more specifically, it prevented the development of heart failure and heart failure events with a very large uh, confident, uh, hazard ratio, about a 35% risk reduction. Um, and uh, this has been not replicated, but at least similar data from other SGL2 inhibitors suggesting it might be a class effect. So now we have one class that's probably bad for you if you have heart failure, the DPP-4 inhibitors or the gliptins. We have this other class, the SGL2 inhibitors, which seems to be good at preventing cardiovascular disease and in particular at preventing heart failure. And those are the ones that you can't pronounce, all so the empagliflozin, canagliflozin. You can't figure out how you're supposed to say it. That's, that's the class I'm talking about. Um, and uh, and so, th so that was creating confusion and coined this new term, the metabulodiuretic, because the SGL2 inhibitors have a variety of uh, interesting effects on the vasculature and in the kidney, and they definitely are cause an osmotic diuresis. So what the mechanism uh, that might explain cardiovascular benefits and heart failure benefits in particular uh, from this class of drugs, I think, is still somewhat, um, somewhat uncertain. Um, and then the third class is the GLP-1 agonists. Um, and so those are the ones that these are all sub-Q drugs. And uh, liraglutide had the biggest trial leader, which again showed uh, improvement in cardiovascular outcomes and maybe a suggestion in heart failure, although probably no specific effect in heart failure, so maybe good in cardiovascular uh, neutral on heart failure outcomes, although at the same time, uh, GLP-1 agonists improved myocardial oxygen uh, uh, uptake and substrate utilization, so there was a lot of thought that this actually might be the class of drugs most likely to help in heart failure, and we had actually done in the NIH Heart Failure Network a shorter or smaller trial of trying to use liraglutide in patients at the time they went home from the hospital. It was published in JAMA two years ago called FIGHT, and that actually showed a 30% risk reduction, uh, sorry, 30% risk increase in patients uh, treated with aragotide, although not significantly, uh, not statistically significant in this small trial. So I think we're left with this massive confusion right now about these anti-diabetic drugs and what's safe, what's dangerous, what might actually be beneficial in heart failure. And there's a whole series of trials, mostly focused on the SGL2 inhibitors in HEF-PEF, in HEF-REF, uh, in patients with and without diabetes 
trying to, exist, to figure out, could these actually be cardiovascular drugs in addition to anti-diabetes drugs? So this, I think, is a, a field right now that has a lot of confusion. I think there'll be greater clarity in the years to come, uh, but I think a very rapidly evolving part of the heart failure uh, space. So I think, um, just to conclude, I think we've actually got a lot to celebrate uh, in how we've improved our treatments of patients with, with HEFREF. If you look compared to patients in the hospital or patients with HEFPATH, both of which have been, I think, in general, a, a lot of disappointment. Um, and I was super glad to get asked to talk about HEFREF because it actually feels kind of good to talk about, uh, as opposed to HEFPATH, which feels kind of depressing. Um, <laughs> but I think there's... Uh, uh, a lot of interesting things in the pipeline. I think a lot of interesting things which I didn't uh, talk about because of time, uh, gene therapy, cell therapy, neuromodulation, uh, different forms of mechanical support. Um, and then finally, just to close, I think a key uh, unmet need as we think about all these great new treatments is we have to do a better job of optimizing the drugs that we have. We could actually make a massive public health benefit in the United States and the Western world today just by optimizing the tools we already have and know how to use and getting all our patients uh, who need them on the best doses of the best meds. So uh, thank you all very much for your attention. And I have 56 seconds left. Mike, thank, thank you for that just fantastic um, overview. We do have some time built in for, for questions. Well, I would have talked for a little bit longer if I'd known that. That's right. We I, did could that avoid, uh, I could avoid questions. <laughs> so, oh, Can I have oh. my backup slides? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so, yeah, we never load those backup slides per protocol. Yeah. I'll, I'll start it off, if I may. I was intrigued about the design, terosamide versus furosemide survival, powered to survival. And, you know, so diuretics on top of what you've shown to achieve that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong in, in terms of what you showed us, but uh, the, the hypothesis or biologic premise, certainly it makes sense with minimizing wall tension, maybe then you minimize the cascade. Yeah. But do you think there'll be a survival advantage, one um, diuretic versus I think, another? I think, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's tactics and there's strategy. What I mean by that is tactics is like, you're not doing a great job on frosamide. I think if we switch you to torsamide, you're probably going to diurese better. And most people who, I don't know what y'all's experience is, my own anecdotal experience is, is that that works. And people who are relatively diuretic resistant to oral diuretics, switching them to torsamide often helps. But that's not really a rationale to change practice. Some of this was grantsmanship with the NIH. But torsamide, interestingly, when you look at animal models, unlike frosamide, one big difference is torsamide is very antifibrotic. And so there's a lot of change in myocardial fibrosis in patients treated, in animals treated chronically with torsamide versus furosemide. And there's a little bit of human data, but it's not very good. So I think really the hypothesis is, can you achieve uh, similar diuresis, but also have some underlying biologic effects? Um, and I didn't go into it, but transform, one of the interesting things about it is it's one of these, uh, uh, this new wave of what you might call pragmatic very pragmatic clinical trials. Uh, so patients get uh, randomized to, to, and it's open label, you know whether you're on torsamide or frosamide, um, and then they never have any more study visits. Everything else is done over the phone. Uh, so it's, you know, I think we're all, the, cl the clinical trial enterprise, anybody who does clinical trials knows is, is basically unsustainable to have these incredibly expensive trials that are hugely intensive, that go on, uh, it's just not, you can't develop drugs this way in the long term, especially as you get diminishing returns as you get more and more effective treatment. So I think the next 20 years is gonna be this period of a lot of transformation, transform, get it? Uh, and uh, in the clinical trial enterprise in, in terms of how we conduct these trials and trying to figure out how we can do more pragmatic real world trials that aren't, don't create such sort of a false, uh, whether it will work or not, I, I, that's what we do the trials, I don't know. Question in the is there any other mechanism uh, of, of um, uh, increasing survival, if it does that, of this new drug that decreases the rate of uh, the SA node other than incrementally increasing cardiac output by, by increasing the diastolic filling period? Yeah, so you mean of Aberdeen, so which slows the, slows the heart rate. Um, yeah, it actually is not, I think the findings of shift, I guess I would say were not particularly surprising to me because I, it's hard to think from that 
mechanism that you get dramatic improvements in mortality. Now, if you look at Aberdeen, slowing the heart rate actually does uh, diminish somewhat things like hormonal activation and things, other things you might anticipate as having uh, uh, long-term effects. But I really think of Aberdeen, as I said, as um, as having an important niche in a probably a select group of patients who have what seems like a high degree of resting heart rate, even though they're on good dose of beta blockers. And I'll, my own experience has been that most people, including myself, say, I don't have anybody like that because I'm such a great heart failure doc. All my patients are like super well beta blocked, right? Like all your patients like have a heart rate of 60, right? So then if you go to your clinic and start looking at the heart rates, you're like, oh, actually, I'm not as good as I think. But then because you're, you rationalize, say, well, they just walked in really fast from the uh, from triage. That's why their heart rate is, they were hurrying to get here. But, um, but in truth, if you look at your own clinic, I suspect what you'll find is that most of your patients have a lot of higher heart rate than, than you think. But I, I think it's important to say beta blockers are probably the single most powerful mortality improving agent we have. So Vabradine is not a substitute for beta blockers. So some people are like, I don't want to up the beta blocker so I can put them on some Vabradine, and that is definitely not the right approach. You have to maximize their beta blocker first, and then a page of persistent heart rate, uh, you know, over 70 or 75, depending on what you look at, despite good doses of beta blockade. Good morning. Good morning, doctor. I work at the VA Houston Hospital, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of patients uh, within 50 to 60 years old uh, with a HRF, and uh, mostly uh, uh, polysubstance abuse, cocaine, cannabis. And, um, uh, he is already on, uh, on a beta blocker and uh, entresto and spironolactone. Uh, he has uh, uh, amiodarone and uh, digoxin on board. Uh, the heart rate has been like 88, uh, 96, 104. Uh, can you give me the, uh, is it worth? Uh, 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 doing the evaporative. Yeah, I think that would be, and he's in sinus rhythm? Yes. Yeah, so I think that's, a, you know, people who are well on a good dose of beta blockers and have those persistently kind of unexplained or concerning amount of sinus tachycardia or even high heart rates in the 80s, 90s, I think are a good good candidate for evaporative. Yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic overview. In this era of cardio mems, do you think the in the newer heart failure trials should have an arm or a subpopulation of patients who have cardiomems in them, and yeah. what do you think is its role? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see how it all evolves. We used to joke that if you had a cardiomems in, like you were the most valuable, you know, you should charge double for your participation in clinical trials because everybody wanted, everybody wanted to get those patients in their clinical, like especially early phase trials where you're trying to understand um, physiology. I think... Uh, to generalize from your question a little bit, I think one of the things we're going to see in clinical trials is the use of various forms of remote monitoring, whether it's cardiomems or actigraphy or whatever it is, to actually, again, try to move trials from sort of the research institute, like where we are now, out to the real world where patients actually live. And I think a great example is the six-minute walk. It's like anybody who goes and watches the six-minute walk can't have much confidence in the six-minute walk as an endpoint because like people are at least at our place like people are cutting through the hallway like to get to the bathroom or whatever like there's you know somebody leaves a wheelchair in the way I mean it's just um, it's, and it's not a real world thing what real world is like when you go out can you go to the Walmart and you have to stop uh, halfway through to catch your breath or not so really things like uh, f functional capacity. Uh, are much better measured out in the real world by uh, things that actually measure real world activity as opposed to the very sort of uh, false way we, we do it in clinical trials. So I think um, whether it's invasive monitoring, wearables, whatever, I think clinical trials, you know, 15 years ago, or 15 years from now are going to look much different than they did 15 years ago. Thank you for a great talk. One more question, if I may. And, and you presented all these great new drugs and trials, and, and we're fascinated on the cheap diuretics. So uh, one, forgive me, one more question about the torsamide trial. How are you going to ensure adequate or equivalent doses of the torsamide and, and furosemide in that trial? Yeah, that's the beauty of pragmatism, is, and that's where randomization and size helps you. So in a big trial, you don't have to worry about it, basically, because if you have 3,000 people in each arm, uh, you just say 
take care of this person in the best way that makes sense to you. Because it's hard, I mean, we found this in dose. Uh, diuretics are a drug that you titrate and based on sometimes very obvious and sometimes sort of subtle clinical things. And so to say we're gonna do a trial and you're assigned to be on this dose and you're assigned to be on that dose just doesn't work for diuretic trials. Um, because it'd be like an insulin trial where you, we assign you to 20 units of insulin. Like that may or may not be the right insulin dose for you. So really the idea is to say like, use this in your clinical practice as a tool or use this in your clinical practice as a tool and we'll see what. Now if you're doing a 50 patient trial, you can't do that because there's you don't have you have too much uncontrolled variability. But size and randomization can actually solve a lot of design problems in trials. Um, that's really one of the biggest advantages of this sort of pragmatic trial movement is that if you have a, a lot fancier trial, you can do a lot bigger trial um, for the same costs. So you know a six thousand patient trial, and these are not actual numbers; they're just so. Like Paradigm had 8,000 patients. I think Paradigm probably cost about about 300 million dollars. Um, you know, Transform is 6,000, and it costs um, logarithmically less than that. So you have to. I think one of the great advantages of these very simple pragmatic trials is that they are real world. They're going to be less expensive. They're going to be designed to answer one simple question, um, and they're not going to be the right. Uh, strategy for every question, but I think for a lot of questions, real world questions, they're gonna make a big difference. Excellent. Thank you.